Hello and welcome, everybody. It's time for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Welcome to the show, folks. My name is Chris Smith, and I am your host every week for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality and us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. As always, it's good to be with you as we get ready to meet interesting people and learn some new and interesting things about what is happening out there in the world of science, nature, conservation, art, education, and more. We tend to cover lots of really great topics with this particular series, uh, and I think that's why so many people come back every Wednesday at noon to join us for this program. If this is your first time joining us for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, jump into the chat over there on YouTube, say hi, maybe let us know where you're watching from, if you're in North Carolina or beyond. Uh, of course, if this is, you know, like the 150th time you've tuned into the Discovery Series, it's great to have you here too. Uh, and you can also jump into the chat and say hello. It's good to see so many names that pop up in the chat every week. Uh, like I see that John Sykes is here. I see Kim in the chat. Hey, the aquarium on Roanoke Island is here watching the program too. It's great to see everybody. But yeah, jump in the chat and, you know, let me know how things are going. Also, of course, if you know or you didn't know, the Lunchtime Discovery Series is interactive. So as we go throughout the presentation, feel free to be chatting with folks over there and leave questions for today's guest speaker as we go. Having your questions in the chat means that they're all queued up for me when we get to our audience Q&A section at the end of the program. They'll be there. I can grab them and moderate them over to our guest speakers. Uh, every week, there's audience Q&A. So bring your curious minds every single time to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. For today's program, uh, of course, once again, the folks at the EE office have managed to find somebody interesting, doing really interesting stuff. Let's meet him. Will Freund. He's the project lead for Climate, Kayak, and Conversation. Uh, and I've seen some pretty incredible pictures online getting ready for this talk of the ocean and of a giant kayak. Will, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Chris. I am so excited to be here. Thank you to the museum and the office of EE uh, for letting me come in and talk about this crazy adventure that I'm on and to share my story. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this one. Uh, I like adventure stories and just seeing like a picture that you shared of this giant boat and then a tent on top of the boat. And then all this gear that somehow you, I don't, I guess you managed to keep dry. I don't know, but it looks like uh, quite the feat. It definitely was. And I would love to say right off the bat, not everything stayed dry, but that's what we have the sun for to dry things out most of the time. <laughs> well, excellent, excellent stuff. Uh, I see more folks are joining us in the chat. That's great. I love to see that. Uh, but Will, let's learn more about the work you've been involved in. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and get started here. I'm going to share my screen. If people are seeing me look over to the side, I have my other screen here. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started. All righty. So Excellent. as we were just talking about, uh, I went on a crazy adventure in the last couple of years, and I want to share my story and some of the things that I've learned. So for the title of today's talk, Climate Change in Coastal Communities, A Journey to Understanding. Um, like, they said before, my name is Wolf Rind. I'm the project lead on climate kayak and conversation. Um, and this talk is to be broken down into basically three parts. We're gonna be starting off by just talking about climate change in of itself. Then we're talking about this crazy adventure I decided to go on and what I learned, what I saw, and then finish, uh, finishing it out with what we can do as our communities. So a little bit of background on who I am to kind of build some perspective. Um, I currently am living in Greensboro, North Carolina. I got my bachelor's of science in biology from the College of Charleston, go Cougars. Um, I've worked in environmental education and conservation research over the last four to five years. And also I have my Eagle Scout award. Trust me, that'll all make sense kind of putting that all together in a little bit here. You can see some of the, from the, some of the photos here that I've had quite an adventurous life and I'm very thankful for that. And all of this has been kind of culminating together for this adventure. So. This project, Climate Kayak and Conversation, its mission 
to share stories of how people in coastal communities understand, think, and talk about climate change. Um, this is a nonprofit physically sponsored project by the, the Environmental Educators of North Carolina. They're an organization based here in North Carolina of supporting both formal and non-formal educators across the state to basically help bridge the gap um, for many educators and students across the state and beyond. And it's been a pleasure to work with them throughout this project. Um, for this trip, I was taking a 16 foot sailing kayak from Miami, Florida to Norfolk, Virginia, which is right around 1100 miles up the intercoastal waterway. I'm gonna get into some more of those details at the end, but this is just kind of a general overview of the project. I originally had the idea for this project in the winter of 2018 while I was doing some daydreaming um, because that's where the best ideas come from. Um, but I did not get on the water until March of last year. And as we've all seen, it's been a pretty, pretty crazy last couple of years. So I actually had to get off the water after only a couple of weeks. But I did restart this year uh, where I left off in Florida and finished out in July of this year. You can see my route on the right hand of your screen. Uh, screen here down in Miami, all the way up to Norfolk, Virginia. So covering technically five states, but really mostly four, and then just over the border into Virginia. So starting off with the heavy subject first, climate change. For a lot of us, that brings up a bunch of different emotions. Some good, some bad, some complex. Part of that is because climate change is an incredibly broad subject to bring up. And it probably brings a lot of these other terms to mind, as well as a lot more. Things like climate crisis, Green New Deal, politics, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, you know, all these different terms that mean so many different things in of themselves. How do we even start to talk about climate change when there's all these other things going on? So how do I make it easier? Well, my answer is you go on an adventure. Um, and that is how I had the whole idea for this project, this trip of talking about climate change It started by wanting to go on an adventure and then built from there on how do I make this something about more than just myself? So these are just some of the few photos and you're going to be seeing a lot more photos throughout this entire presentation of this adventure I went on. There's all sorts of different bits of me talking with people in communities about how they feel about climate change, the impacts that they're seeing, what um, perspectives that they bring based on their worldviews. I saw environments across the entire spectrum from the mangroves down in Florida to the marshes of Georgia to the vast and wide sounds here in North Carolina and everything in between. And that all leads to then our storytelling of which sounds more interesting. A thousand mile journey to hear stories of a changing world or a lecture series on climate change impacts. Both are important, both are interesting. But if we think about the general culture or our general society, the general populace, which of the two do you think people are more likely to spend more time listening to and paying attention to? probably the 1100 mile journey to hear stories of a changing world because that sounds more interesting. There's a story associated with it. And by adding a story to a complex topic, you can retain a lot more of your audience rather than just putting out a bunch of facts. Now facts are important, but you need to substitute in a story as well. Now, I do also want to pose a question to all of us in our community here, all of us watching today, um, to put down in the chat box or just think about to yourself, how would you summarize your feelings towards climate change in one or two sentences? Now, I also wanna say through this is, I want to make this a safe space for everyone to share their ideas. That if you see something in the chat box that you may not necessarily agree with, or you might not necessarily have an affinity towards that's okay. We're here to share our ideas and share our perspectives to then create a better community. So I just ask that we all be respectful of the responses that we see in the chat box here. Um, but I also pose this same question to a lot of the community of that I'm in. I pose it to my social media and I wanna share some of the responses that I saw while I was um, reading some of these. 
and they're wide ranging. So things like humans make a big mess and don't clean up after themselves. I think we can all point to a good part of that, that we can easily see trash, but also we can talk about, you know, the greenhouse gases that we see in our atmosphere that we're not so great at cleaning up. We can be more sustainable, but that takes away from the big picture. I'm a big advocate for the big picture, taking a step back that what's happening in your local community, but then also take a step back. What's happening in the big picture across our world. This one hit me really hard. We're stealing the future from children. That is a pretty tough one for me to think about and to kind of internalize. Living in low income, not having the finances to deal with a changing world is something that a huge portion of our world is having to deal with. And that's happening right here within our country and within our state. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that that's happening. Striving to be greener in our everyday life, but it's kind of a catch-22 of trying to be good in our personal lives, but then we've got this you know, larger system of politics and industries that we also have to grapple with. Partisan divisions. Where does that money come from? These are things that other people are thinking about. Confusing and frustrating information. We need to continue to work on the education that we're seeing in our communities to help make sure that we're all on the same page. And also climate change is incredibly complex. It is incredibly confusing and wide ranging. We can't expect everyone to know everything. So how do we communicate these incredibly complex topics in a very short amount of time to people that don't have a background in a lot of this? And that's a Thing that a lot of people are struggling with. So these are just a few things that I'd seen from my social media and my community. Chris, has there been any other things popping up in the chat box? Well, you know, what came up in the chat so far uh, kind of mimics some of the thoughts that you're seeing here, uh, which is feeling overwhelmed and frustrated. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And that gets really to what I was mentioning earlier, that it's this huge topic. It's incredibly complex, and there's so many different aspects to it. Of There's a social side, and there's a justice element, and there's a racial element, and there's like community, and politics, and finances, and industry, and local versus global, and all these different things together. Where do we start? And I get that. Because I struggle with that myself. And my way of starting is kind of two-parted of me going on a personal journey, going on this crazy journey, but then also turning around to share my story to then build out my community of who I can talk about climate change with. Because ultimately, and I'll get to this later, is the best way to advance climate change, to help you know, progress us facing climate change as a society, is just to talk about it. The more we talk about it, the more change we can start to make. So we started to talk a little bit about climate change and we'll start to get into the adventure and my journey. What impacts did I actually see? I traveled over a thousand miles, four inches above the water. I had to have seen some stuff, right? Absolutely. So here's just a few list of a list of a few things that I've seen and some pictures to go along with it. Every day I was picking up trash. I even had this orange bucket here. I called my trash trash bucket because the bucket itself was a piece of trash that I picked up that I then put all of the trash that I picked up in. And I had a little net that I picked up my trash in the water or anywhere that I camped on land or walking around. I picked up my trash along the way because I did my best to offset any trash that I produced on my trip. I tried to pick up more than I produced. Tropical systems. So this journey was generally from March until July, and we now have our tropical systems are starting in May and June now. And I had to pull off the water, or at least, you know, tie my boat up twice during this trip, um, both while I was in North Carolina, for tropical systems that are moving through. Now, they were both tropical storms when they were coming through, but nonetheless, we're going to start seeing more tropical systems more often 
as the years go on. Um, and so that was just something that really started to play in my mind that I was intending, I had built into my itinerary of having to pull off the water for at least one tropical system, but not two. Now, thankfully, I was able to keep up and, you know, cut, you know, a few days here and there to make up for lost time. But between the two storms, I was probably off the water for over a week between the two storms just to make sure that I was safe, my gear was safe, and the fact that I was traveling by myself, I had the opportunities to progress in a safe manner. Coastal flooding. Um, this is just one photo, but there's tons of different photos that could be shown here of how, you know, sea level is rising, tides are, our tidal range is increasing over time. And so we're starting to see more forests starting to get flooded out. And we're only gonna see more of that over time as well as in our communities, towns like here in North Carolina, like Wilmington, like Moorhead, Beaufort, where I was moving from before I was here in Greensboro, I was out on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. As our tides get bigger, more of our communities are going to start flooding just at high tide. And so these are impacts that we're going to continue to see um, in a lot of our coastal communities. Heat waves. We definitely have seen some heat waves in the last couple of years. We had some heat waves here on the East Coast this year, and don't get me wrong, they were definitely hot, but they were nowhere near the heat waves we saw in the Pacific Northwest this year of absolutely record triple digits. And we're only gonna continue to see more of those. And I saw just a little bit of me on my boat here and living without air conditioning for four months really gives you a perspective on the heat that you can feel and all as well as what you can tolerate. My, for me, I didn't really have much of a fan. All I had was the sunshade here um, and hopefully crossing my fingers for a breeze. And then also extreme development. I can't tell you how many islands I was passing um, because I had land on both sides, but with the barrier islands, most on my right side, um, the amount of new construction going up. And it's great that our people are getting out and going to the beach. I love that more people are going to the beach. However, with the caveat of two things, one, we're having more people visit our coastal areas that do not have the infrastructure to support these excessive populations of people coming to visit. Plus also it's putting an undue burden on these environments that can be very fragile um, of we could have excess pollution, excess runoff, um, as well as just more people going in some of these environments that are very fragile and could be easily impacted by these excessive number of people visiting these areas. This is just one example here that you can see this, the uh, steam stacks there. This is on Amelia Island down in Florida. There are two paper mills on the island there. Um, and this is just one example on top of all the housing projects that I've seen throughout this entire trip. And there's countless more examples I could talk about, but I don't wanna have us end up in too much of a downward swing. Um, so I will continue on with, what did I learn? So I saw all these things, I was talking with all these people. What did I take away from this crazy trip? To put it simply, it's complicated, like really complicated. Uh, in a lot of media, uh, it, climate change is oftentimes put into the of two-sided, believe or not believe, or for or against, or advocate or denial. It's anything but that. Because everywhere I went, no matter what community, people notices the change in their environment. Whether the water was creeping up year over year, there were more storms, the water quality has changed, the, temp the water temperature has rise, the fish populations have changed, whatever it is, those people are noticing the changes in their environment. But not always were they gonna tr attribute them to climate change. And some of them were not necessarily directly related to climate change, but some of the things that were, like more tropical systems, sea level rise, tidal flooding, things like that, aren't necessarily contributed to climate change in some of these people in, in their communities. So as I said, climate change is anything but two-sided. Because everyone wants a better future for their kids. I don't think I met a single person that was like, nah, it can be worse for the next generation. I've had a good life. I don't really care about the next, you know, 
my grandkids, my kids, my cousins, family, friends. We all want a better future for our communities. It just might not all agree on how to do that. And even more so, in the digital age that we live in, of social media and these echo chambers that we build around ourselves, and I'm guilty of it as well, misinformation and disinformation is absolutely more widespread than I thought it was. And we need to continue to combat that by checking our sources and just having that little voice in the back of our head think, what do you think this information came from? And then following it up on. Which all leads to, we all perceive climate change differently. And this is based on who we are, our surroundings and our worldview of how did we grow up? Who were we around? What communities are we a part of? And how does that influence the world that we perceive? Which can then, based on all these different things, age, location, socioeconomic status, race, religion, political affiliation, all these different aspects alter how we see our world. And so how I view my world is different than how how anyone else does. Um, That doesn't mean, you know, one way is right or wrong, but how we approach our conversation around climate change needs to be taken into effect on our worldview. Because for some people, the things that climate change implies, that we've been affecting our planet, that we've been changing our planet for the worse, that, you know, species are being drastically affected, humans are being affected, our planet is not a limitless resource. These are things that are challenging people's entire worldview. And so by just you know, using facts, you can't change someone's entire worldview just based on facts. And so to do that, we need to start with an empathy approach and come to them on where they are at and use a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of emotion to bridge that gap, to build that common point so that we can then further our conversation from there. It can be hard, it can be difficult, but I hope that eventually we can start to move that way. Because many communities are not even talking about it. This is due to things like lack of awareness. They're not seeing it day to day. And I'm just guilty of this one here, it's too politicized that, you know, I have thoughts about climate change, but I may not bring it up with people because of where I think people are at of, oh, this is too political. I don't know if I necessarily want to bring this up in this conversation because I don't want the conversation to turn political, but we live in a society now that climate change is so interconnected with our political discourse. And particularly when it comes to talking about climate change, there's two demographics that are going to be most advocate about climate change in terms of affecting and combating climate change. Those that are most affected which tend to be minority communities, low income communities, as well as those on the front lines, you know, your coastal communities, or those that have the time and the finances of all your basic needs are met and you now then have the free time and the financial ability to donate and give your time to the organizations to help combat climate change. Because if you're worried about putting food on the table or paying your rent, or it's not affecting you day to day, you're probably not gonna have climate change be at the forefront of your thoughts. And so that's why I want to then think about these four key things in order of how do we progress towards a better world and more action on climate change, which starts with awareness. You can't act on climate change if you aren't aware about it. So start with awareness, just talking about it. Once we are aware about it, we can start to have education about it, of where are we? Um, What can we learn? What's in our communities? What's in our local environments? Let's go outside, let's go for a walk. It's amazing how much you can learn about your local environment just by going for a walk. Once you go for that walk, you take that educational program and you do that eco-tourism, you make that connection with your community. You make that connection with your environment. Once you make that connection, you start to enjoy it. You care about it, you have that, rooted area in your heart that you love your area that you live in and you want to protect it. That then leads to your action. And you can do that in all sorts of ways of engaging in your community, doing cleanups, voting, 
um, being conscious in your decisions that you make. And I'll talk all about this at the end here as well, what you can do. But these are kind of the, the steps that we need to think about in making progress towards climate change action. It's more than just, you know, policies. Policies are important, but we need to have, make sure that we're all on board with this because if we leave people behind, it's not gonna be a complete solution. So now that we've got the heavy climate change out of the way, let's talk about this adventure that I wanna, because I wanna make sure I got to the climate set, the climate change part first. So this adventure, starting in Miami, Florida, going up to Norfolk, Virginia, along the intercoastal waterway in this crazy boat called a Hobie Mirage Adventure Island. You can see a few photos of it here. Um, yes, that green thing sitting next to me there is my tent. I slept on the boat almost every single night and I sailed it in that view looking forward uh, with my feet there, that is pretty much the view I had for four months straight. But I want to talk about the intercoastal waterway real quick here. That this is an inland waterway system that basically st stretches the entire eastern half of the United States from the most southern point of Texas on the Gulf Coast all the way around and around the tip of Florida and up the east coast. Now for me, I just went on the east coast part here. It's three different sections. So I just did the east coast section here. It's the oldest section. Um, but it's an inland waterway. You can see this picture here. We've got our barrier islands on the left side and the mainland on the right side. And that's all the way. Um, in most of its natural areas, rivers, bays, sounds. And then occasionally we would have to connect them with man-made canals or locks, whatever it might be. Um, but most of it is natural areas. And then occasionally we have to carve a channel because of our deeper draft boats. And according to the Army Corps of Engineers, the main channel should be 100 feet wide uh, by 12 feet deep. It's not always maintained, but that's the ideal situations um, for a lot of the vessels. And they've been using the intercoastal waterway for over 200 years. They first surveyed the intercoastal waterway before our country was even founded. Um, so that kind of gives you a perspective of like how far back in our history, and it was used for transporting goods and services throughout our nation's history um, during times of war, during times of you know economic boom, um, whatever in, they needed to do, we used it. And particularly here in even North Carolina, across our sounds, um, that's how a lot of the goods were transported from you know the Outer Banks up to New England. Things like the Currituck duck was an absolute delicacy um, in the early 20th century um, and the late uh, 19th century um, of transporting all those things up to New England along this intercoastal waterway. So next time you drive up to the beach, you'll see a little sign that says Army Corps of Engineers, Intercoastal Waterway. You're crossing over that and all water there is connected. I think that's pretty cool. I wanna share a few more photos here of my life on the water. Um, you can see you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything between here. Um, things from me tying up marinas uh, to generally what I carried every single day, you can see the bottom left there of my uh, PFD, my personal flotation device with my GPS on one side, my VHF radio and my snacks and my other electronics, my tent, all that packed up there. Um, I even cooked on the boat. So you know, got my little stove there and I think that's me making coffee in the morning. Um, but then also things break. So you look at the bottom right there, that's the pedal drive system that I had. And, um, there's supposed to be two fins there and there's only one. That was not a great day. If you want to learn more about that, I have a blog post on my website that talks all about my worst day on the water. But then I also had some of the best days. Sunsets, sunrises, absolutely gorgeous. And there are going to be days that I will never forget. And it was just so, so beautiful. And I encourage anyone, if you live near the coast, get out, see it. It's beautiful and amazing. So now you're starting to think, okay, he's talked about climate change. He's talked about this crazy adventure he's gone on. Overall, what do we do now? You know, I've talked a little bit about some of the things that's happened in our communities, but what can you do? What can I do? So I have six things. First thing, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. Start talking about climate change in your community. It doesn't matter where you stand, how much you know, how little you know, 
where you sign up, just start by talking about climate change. Because once we start to do that, we can start to think about it more. And then once we start to just have this, you know, climate change topic in the back of our mind, we can start to make more connections to it. Share your story. Here I am sharing my story of what's happened to me over the last three years, the things that I've learned, but that's my story. That's not your story. So use your community, use your platforms to tell your story and tie that into climate change. You'll be amazed of how things can tie in, even if they seem unrelated at first. Get involved in your community. A lot of this is redundant because I think it's important um, of whether that's getting involved with a local environmental organization or education or just any part of your community. Building a better community is the way that we can start to progress together because the only way that we're going to combat climate change is if we do it together. Go on your own adventure. This is me. I went on my adventure for 1,100 miles, but that's my adventure. What's your adventure? Even if it's the simplest thing, going out for a walk once a week or going on a camping trip for your, a weekend, first time going camping or it's something you do every weekend, go on your adventure and go back to number two. Share your story of what you did on your adventure. I guarantee you there are people that want to know about your adventures, want to know about your stories. I'm still having to remind myself that people want to hear your stories because that's what we've been doing our entire, you know, existence is our species. As human beings, we are storytellers. And no one can take your story away from you. And that's one of the most important things that we have to share. But then also think a more practical side. Make conscious decisions about the things that you do, the things you buy, and the overall, you know, world that you decide to live in. Of think about the packaging that you buy or the packaging that you don't buy. Um, and you know, where you decide to go, how you decide to travel, all these different things start to, you know, they might have small impacts here and there, but it also helps develop your worldview. Um, that worldviews do not change overnight. They change slowly over time based on the decisions that we make in our lives and the communities we decide to make ourselves a part of. And the last thing that everyone can do, no matter who you are, as long as you're over the age of 18, is vote. And that's beyond the federal level. Look at your state organizations, look at your local organizations. The things that happen in your community can be greatly affected by the things happening in your local government, whether that is zoning, water management, waste management, um, new constructions, old construction. All these things can be affected by your local organizations, your local government, and you have the power to help affect that all you have to do is get involved and vote. Putting that all together, climate change, it's really complicated, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about it. Going on your own adventure is a really great way of helping tie it all together. This is my story. And thank you for being here so that I can share my story. And here's some things that you can do. So thank you. Um, overall, this is something that we have to continue to work on and I'm gonna to continue to share my story and I hope you will share your story as well. But overall, I'm gonna turn things back over to Chris. If you guys have any questions, please drop them down in the chat box below. I'm happy to answer them. Here's my contact information as well. If you wanna send me a more private message on my email or send me something on Twitter. But overall, thank you so much to all of you for coming and I'm happy to answer your questions. All right, everybody, let's give Will a great big uh, virtual emoji round of applause <laughs> in the chat for being on the program today and sharing sharing this, this adventure. I mean, what a, okay, one, that's a great idea, I think, that you had to just hit the water and talk to people along the way. Because, yeah, I mean, this is a lecture series, to, to your point earlier in the program, where we talk yeah. about things like climate change. But at the same time, you know, for this group of people, the I think the folks who tune into this program, right, we can have a lecture series where we're talking about, uh, you know, the big issues and where we can get to, you know, the actual stories that, that drive the changes that 
I think people tuning into this program believe should happen and want to see happen in our communities and in our state and, and around the world. So I think that's a really cool thing. Uh, folks, let me remind you, if you've been tuned in watching, drop your questions, thoughts for Will in the chat. I'm going to turn to those in just a moment. So get your typing fingers rocking and rolling in the chat. And now the, uh, the applauses are rolling in. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Will, I'm, I'm curious about an adventure like this because I have not gone an 1100 mile journey uh, up yeah. the East Coast from Miami to Norfolk. Uh, I can't say that I've done anything quite that adventurous. I've done some adventures a little bit, but nothing quite logistically as challenging as something like that. Can you tell us a little bit about just bringing it together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one thing I also uh, went to mention at the end there is if you were really interested in things like this, this whole project is being put together hopefully crossing fingers into a full length documentary that will be produced and uh, hopefully be released sometime next summer. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and I'm sure all of the communities that you found, if you found your way here, you will probably see something about it um, in the next year or so coming out about that. But you were talking logistics. Nice. Yes. Um, more than anything, uh, the one thing I like to tell people is that I could not have done this trip this project, this whole adventure by myself, that yes, I am the one on the water. I am the one, you know, out doing all the filming and talking with all the people, but it really took village um, in kind of two ways. One, having a support network, that there were days that I just did not want to get up, days that I did not want to, you know, plan things or, you know, try and coordinate meetings, um, but having a support network of both family and friends and also having a social media presence of, you know, people to rely on helps keep me accountable to the things that I wanted to do. But then secondly, of the actual planning. Um, so I had mentioned at the beginning, I had this idea back in 2018, you know, end of the year, you know, November, December, but I didn't even get on the water until 2020. So it's over 12 months. It was actually closer to 16 months of planning. Um, and I probably could have gotten it, you know, sooner, but I'm glad I had that amount of time. And um, because it came down to a couple of things. One, since this was just a project, this was not a part of a university. This was not, you know, a graduate program or capstone or thesis. Um, I had no organization uh, backing me right away. Um, and to get a lot of the funding for doing a project like this, uh, a lot of organizations are not just going to give, you know, give money or equipment, you know, Joe Schmo will uh, for fun. Um, I need to have, you know, a mission. I need to have a backer. And so for me, that was the Environmental Educators of North Carolina. So they signed on as the nonprofit fiscal sponsor to basically act as the nonprofit umbrella for this project, which allows me then to apply for grants, um, apply for sponsorships, donations, so that any, anyone else donating can basically write it off for them um, as a donation for tax purposes, as well as then it you know, protects me on my end um, and it makes it all you know, nice and easy. Um, but then from there, it's a lot of funding. So, you know, going through things like GoFundMes or approaching, you know, gear organizations. So I've had a bunch of sponsors throughout this project, people like Patagonia, Great Outdoor Provisioning Company right here in North Carolina, um, the North Carolina Sierra Club, um, Kitty Hawk Kites out of the Eider Banks, organizations like that, all from all different backgrounds kind of coming together to help support this project, whether it was monetarily or through gear um, to kind of build it up over time. And then the actual logistical side is actually have a massive spreadsheet somewhere that labeled, this was my start, like day one, I was going to go from here to here. This is where I was going to stay. This is like my coordinates, all the other things. And I had that for every single day. I was going to go from here to here. This is my distance I laid out for every day so that I then plotted it on my GPS. So literally all I had to do on the day that I was on the water, all I had to do was day two route go. Um, and I actually had it all keyed in with um, my Bluetooth on my phone um, so that it was easy for me to update things over time as well. And the really cool thing for a lot of people that were following when the trip was actually happening, if you see on the project website, and you can still go see it now on climatekayakandconversation.org, you actually have the ability, there's a button that you can click that says, where is Will? And it actually had a GPS track of my entire way. So people actually could go see where I was at any one time and track me along the whole trip. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's 
gotta have that. I think that uh, for people to be able to follow the journey uh, through social media, but also keeping track of, of your progress on a map is really exciting. Um, a question came in from the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Would you do another trip like this again? And what would you do differently? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, so if I had to do another trip again, um, I would kind of change a couple of things. Um, first of all, I would change the vessel because um, I've kind of proven that I can do it on a 16, you know, 16 foot kayak. Um, and I might change, you know, the length or the route. Um, I would really like the idea of doing, you know, a, a, you know, a yearly, you know, week or two week paddle in, you know, either doing the same route every year and seeing how it changes or just doing the same week every year in a different location. Um, but doing a, a three month trip, a uh, three and a half month trip is really taxing in a lot of different ways of it's kind of taxing financially, it's taxing mentally, and it's taxing emotionally. Um, of being away from my friends, being away from my family, being out in the elements for three months, um, it's tough. Um, and so definitely I would, I want to do something similar. Um, I'm just not sure what, but it definitely would definitely be either on a smaller, you know, shorter trip on a kayak or, um, you know, a longer distance trip on a bigger boat. Yeah, maybe like a 160 foot yacht next time instead of a 16 foot kayak. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. I could do that. That could be fun. <laughs> maybe not that, solo. That though. might not. Yeah, that might not work for the climate change message. Um, driving a giant boat up the coast. Um, no, yeah. Um, um, I had a great question. Now I've lost it. So I'm going to go to the chat. Did you ever have a moment of fear or panic while you were sleeping on the water? Uh, sleeping wise, um, I don't think I ever had any real moments while I was sleeping. Um, I was fairly confident in a lot of the times that I was uh, sleeping. So I had really two different ways that I would be sleeping. So I always slept on the boat. Um, but I either would have an anchor and throw out the anchor, you know, and get it stuck on the bottom and tie that off to the boat. And actually would do two anchors, one off the bow, one off the stern, front and back. And I would be fairly secured there. And then also there's an app on your phone called Anchor, uh, an anchor watch. So basically it tags my GPS location that if I go with outside of, you know, 10 meter radius circle, it all, all of a sudden starts going off and you're like, by the way, you're drifting. Um, and so that, that was, I felt secure that, you know, if that needed to happen, um, I was able to make a choice to, you know, change my location. I also was very deliberate in where I chose to set up my nights um, uh, you know, kind of tucked into way into coves because the main time that it was kind of the two reasons that it would be worrisome for me being out on the water while I was sleeping and anchored out is if the wind shifted or the tide shifted and I wasn't ready for it. Um, but I tried to, you know, plan for those things, look at the weather reports, look at, you know, tide reports, all these different things that I planned accordingly so that I was safe when I was sleeping. Now, when I was sleeping in marinas, tying up, that's super easy. Um, but in terms of you know, fear and scared. There definitely was one moment, particularly um, when I was down uh, outside of Georgetown, South Carolina, not Georgetown, Beaufort, Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, I was crossing uh, one of the sounds there and my pedal drive, going back to that photo, uh, when you saw just one, there was supposed to be my, pe my pedal drive system, there's supposed to be two fins there and there was just one. That's because the fin had sheared off in the middle of the sound. I was two miles from either shore. The wind was against me, the tide was against me. Um, and I got to the end of that day and I was just emotionally and physically shot. And it would have been a lot worse if it wasn't for the kindness of people that had, I had gotten close to the marina, but I wasn't gonna make it under my own power. And they were kind enough to come over and tow me in the final hundred yards. Um, but that was, that was a really bad day. Um, and it gave me a lot of respect for mother nature more than anything of you might have control over things, but mother nature will always try and throw you a curveball, and you have to be ready for it. Um, so I was thankful that I had repair parts that I was able to get safe and then fix things and continue on from there. Um, but if people are curious, learning more about that really bad day, I do have a blog post on my website talking all about that, about that really bad day. Ooh, I, I really can't imagine like already you talking about, uh, you know, paddling, up the 
the intercoastal waterway, like my shoulders and legs are already sore thinking about it, but then to also like try to figure out how you're going to get across the sound and you've got no power. Yeah. <laughs> you like, yeah. you're just going to have to put your hands in the water and go. Yeah. Now th- a big bonus of this kayak is it did have a sail. So I was able to sail for a good chunk of it. Um, but it was not, it was not the best sailboat and it also was not the best kayak. It was kind of this like medium, but it was not really good either. Um, but it was very versatile. Um, and so when I didn't have my pedals, I was still able to sail and that's ultimately how I moved forward, um, on that bad day. Um, but it, it definitely gave me a, a newfound respect for mother nature. And that's something you don't want to mess with. True enough. Ken is curious if there's a current in the ICW intracoastal waterway, or did you have to paddle mostly? And I guess sail as well. Yeah. Um, so this is a really common question that I get and, um, it is an interesting answer in that current changes all the time. So if we think about the coast, um, if we're out at the beach, we think about the tide, you know, there's low tide and high tide. And, but when you get onto the backside in the intercoastal waterway, um, the current is changing all the time. So if we think about just one island, um, and you know, this side here is the ocean and this side is the inland side. As the water is coming in, water is rushing in the top side and the bottom side of the island, which means that we have a current going this way on an incoming tide on both sides. So there's a current going each direction on the backside. Then as the tide goes out, so that we're going from high tide to low tide, it reverses. And now we have a tide going, a flow going out the top and out the bottom. And that's changing for every single island. So we have a bunch of islands going up all the way up the coast. And so as it's here, we have two islands. If it's coming in, it's coming in and going up towards the backside of this island and down towards the back of that island. So the, the current is constantly changing. Um, and you also can't fully you know, say it's the same current everywhere you go because the tide changes all across the East coast. So down in Miami, the difference between low tide and high tide is like four to six inches, which means that the flow of the current is very slow. It is, you know, less than one mile an hour current. Um, And then you get up here in North Carolina, the difference between low tide is three to five feet usually. And so you get maybe a two or three mile an hour current between low tide and high tide. Sometimes it can be higher, Um, but then even more so, which is the crazy kind of weird physics side is Georgia actually has our biggest, one of our biggest tides along the Southeast coast here. Um, And in the Georgia area, you can get upwards of nine or 10 foot tide differences between low tide and high tide, which means that you also now have nine to 10 feet of water that you need to move between tides and the time changes, you know, it's six hours pretty much between low tide and high tide, um, no matter where you are. So it's, how much water are you moving in that time? And in Georgia, that's a lot of water that needs to move. And so you can have some massive currents that if I didn't time it with the tide to go with the flow of the tide, I was going backwards. Um, So it was really important not to just look at the weather report, but the tide report of when was high tide, when was low tide, where was I going in relation to where the tide was flowing of if I was starting in here, but by the time I got to this point, the tide would be a different current. And like, it is a whole other world um, that if you're not used to living on the coast um, and particularly in areas that have strong tidal currents, it's something you don't necessarily think about. Um, but being on the water, it's, it became second nature to me. Yeah. I, I would, could imagine like you, you're looking at a tide report and you can glance at it and go, Oh, okay. I know where I'm going, but I don't even think I know how to read a tide report to begin with. Yeah, I have no experience with that. So, I mean, that it's really impressive that you develop that skill and that ability and then to be able to apply it to a project like this, uh, which was going to be my next question was just the experience of sitting down and talking to coastal communities and, and residents or people working in these areas about the topic of climate change, because you hit on it like it's it's political, but people still see changes. Um, and sometimes people just don't want to talk about it because I think people are afraid that you're ready to spout off, you know, degrees and percentages and show them charts and graphs instead of really just, you know, 
having a conversation about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the way I, I started a lot of those conversations was not even talking about climate change at all. It started by trying to find a common ground of, okay, we're both sitting in a marina. Okay, that means that likely we like being on the water. Okay, we both like being in the water. Do we both like being on boats? Okay, cool. What kind of boats? Okay, cool. Now we like, okay, we both like being on sailboats. Okay, now that is our common area. So we can start to build from that. It builds a rapport with each other and it builds a mutual respect um, because no one likes being talked down to, no matter who you are. Um, and sometimes when people come in with lots of just facts and graphs and lectures, it can feel like you're being talked down to and people will automatically shut down. And I understand that I've been there before. So starting from a, you know, conversational and level playing field, no matter where we like align on the conversation around climate change, I start from a place of, you know, commonality and then build from there that, I've had people that I've had conversations with that we completely disagree that, you know, I'm here, you know, advocating for change on climate change and, you know, making things better for society and in our communities. And for them, they're like, this is how it's always been. And I don't want things to change. And I don't want these prices to go up. I don't, you know, these are these theories that I have, these conspiracy theories, whatever it is, but it started from a place of respect. And so even at the end, we didn't agree we still walked away saying, I had a good conversation. We might not have agreed, but I appreciate you at least listening. And the way we can continue to make progress is by listening more than we talk. It's an excellent point. Thank you. All right. Another one from the chat for you. Cindy writes, you must have seen a lot of wildlife. Can you share some of what you saw? Yes. I love, love talking about the wildlife that I saw. Um, so being in the intercoastal waterway, uh, I have land on both sides, but I saw so much. Um, so being, you know, in the water area, I saw a lot of your, I would say your classic charismatic megafauna, your big animals. So I saw dolphins, plenty of dolphins. I saw them almost every single day, um, which was, you know, I almost got used to seeing them, um, which was crazy, but I saw things like dolphins, um, no whales, although I guess it's in theory possible, but no whales. Um, uh, plenty of jellyfish, um, particularly down in Florida. Uh, I also had Portuguese men of wars wash up like literally alongside my boat. That was a little scary. Um, but I saw those, I saw sea turtles, um, both loggerhead, which is the main one we get here in North Carolina. Um, but then also green sea turtles. Um, I saw, what else did I see? Um, dolphins, sea turtles, oh, sharks. I saw, I saw, I know for sure two sharks. One of them, I was wa waiting around an island in Florida and this itty bitty little bonnet head shark to swim right by my feet, um, which for me, I thought it was super cool, but a lot of people are freaked out by that, which I understand. Um, <laughs> and I saw alligators and I saw deer. I saw wild horses. Um, I saw otters. Um, I had a snake end up on my boat one morning. Um, oh, and okay. thankfully with my background in environmental education, I used to be a snake caretaker. So I knew my snake species fairly well, and I had not even had my morning coffee yet. And I lifted up a bag and there was a corn snake sitting in my backpack. Um, <laughs> and thankfully I realized, okay, you're, you're still a snake can bite. However, you're non-venomous. So like threat level is much lower now. Um, still trying to figure out how that snake got on my boat saying that I had not touched land in 36 hours. Um, and I was in a metropolitan and I was in a downtown city before that and corn snakes don't swim very much. So I'm still trying, still trying to figure that one on my head several months later, but thankfully he was returned back to land, uh, unharmed both me and the snake. <laughs> um, lots of birds. I'm a big bird nerd. Um, so I actually was recording all the bird species that I saw throughout my trip. I was recording them in the citizen science project eBird. Um, and so of course, uh, over the course of that, you know, three and a half, 1100 mile trip, um, I recorded over a hundred species of bird. Um, this was during spring migration. So that helped a little bit. Um, but yeah, so much wildlife and it was, you know, 
amazing and magical in so many ways and I miss it. Yeah, I'm starting to think, trying to uh, make sure I covered the you know right amount of miles in a day on the water and also trying to bird all day long might slow me down. Yeah, um, thankfully um, with the sail that helped with my mileage a lot. And then on top of that, <laughs> even if I wasn't sailing, I would just get into a pedaling groove. Um, and cause it was, it was a foot pedal kayak. Um, and so I would just end up just, you know, in this rhythm of pedaling all day long. And so with that in the ICW is fairly straight. So I would honestly get bored. And so I would have, you know, my rudder in one hand steering me while just kind of zoned out pedaling. And so then I'd have my phone in my other hand, you know, burning while I can. Um, and I had binoculars on board to also look at, you know, channel markers or to look at other boats um, coming up. Um, and that's a whole other thing you have to learn is like the rules of the road on boating and like the legalities of dealing with the Coast Guard and, and radio channels and all that. Um, but uh, thankfully, since I had it all mapped out on my GPS, I didn't have to think too much. All it literally is I would start in the morning, I'd hit go on my GPS, and then I just followed the route at the end of the day. And then I ended up where I, where I finished. And if I needed to change, I had, since I was within, you know, US land, um, I was within cell phone coverage for 95% of the trip. So, you know, I'm listening to music, listening to podcasts. I can look at Google Maps. I can call. I can do internet searches. And that really helped out, especially saying that I was going by myself, um, that I had access to all this other uh, media and materials. Well, Will, it sounds like you had an incredible time. And it's not over yet because we still have the documentary to look forward to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if people are interested in seeing the adventure side of this trip and more than the, the climate side, the conversations is coming. Um, but if you're really interested in following the adventure that I've been doing, I actually have had a running YouTube series. I have a YouTube channel for the project climate kayak and conversation, um, where I have, uh, weekly videos that I've been putting out of my adventures up the coast right now, according to my YouTube channel, I'm just North of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and there'll be more videos of that coming out in the near future. Um, that's got all my adventures there and some of my conversations and gear and all that fun stuff. But then definitely I've got the full documentary coming out hopefully next summer as well. Okay. There's one more question for you here. I think it's a good one. Uh, did you catch your fish for supper or did you see lots of fish? Yeah. So I actually did zero fishing during the trip. Um, and that was kind of twofold. Uh, one is to technically be doing fishing. You need to have a fishing license. Um, and so with me, and if I was just in one state, yeah, I probably would have, but for me to do fishing for the whole trip, that would have means I had to get fishing licenses in five different states. And I did basically did the math and it would have been over 200, if not $300 to get fishing licenses in all five of those states, especially saying four of them were out of state. And I didn't think that I was going to catch two to $300 worth of fish. Um, and then, oh, kind of three, two is water quality, um, that I didn't, always know the water quality of the places that I was going to be, that there are some places that I was at that when I would talk with the locals, they're like, I don't trust eating the fish out of this area. Um, and then thirdly is cleaning the fish um, would have been a real mess, especially saying that I would have been sleeping in the same area that I was cleaning my fish. And I didn't want, you know, my boat smelling like fish all the time. Um, but no, that that's a very common question that I get. Um, I didn't have, I thought about having a fishing rod. Um, but also that would have been, I'd have to rinse it with fresh water. Otherwise it would have corroded and I had plenty of things that corroded over time. Um, so if I do another short trip, yes, I definitely would plan on doing some fishing. There you go. Well, everybody, one more virtual round of applause for Will. Will, thanks for being on the program today and telling us your story. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for giving me this platform to tell my story. And I look forward to seeing you all outside and sharing your own adventures. All right, everybody. That's our show for today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us and dropping your thoughts and questions in the chat. Back here again next Wednesday at noon for another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series with Dr. Carly Ann York from Lenora Ryan University. We'll be talking about the sensory world of squid and how research on squid could apply to invasive species in North Carolina. So don't miss next week's talk. It'll be right here at the museum's YouTube channel. Of course, you can subscribe below to make sure that you get updates from our channel anytime we go live or post new videos. 
And make sure you're following the museum on social media. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And naturalsciences.org has updates on this program. You can also go to the Office of Environmental Education's website, eenorthcarolina.org, where you can get updates about this program and more that they've got going on. And they post all the time on Twitter about this program and more at North Carolina EE on Twitter. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Take care, stay safe, keep your community safe. We'll see you again next time. Bye folks.